What did you do? Dan, I can't hear you. Dan, I can't hear you. Okay, uh, welcome to uh, Everything Hurts uh, special episode edition. We are here uh, as a as a live stream as part of the Munich Conference. My name is Dan Quintano. I'm from the University of Oslo, and I'm here with James Headers from Cypherskin. James, another live show, exciting. I'm the normal one. <laughs> Everyone who's watching this should understand that he's the weird one, and I'm the normal one. Yeah, well, I've combed my you, I've combed my hair. I had to listen to a long lecture about minding my language and and not saying anything truly dreadful in front of the entire research uh, <laughs> constituents of Norway, um, which I wasn't going to do anyway. But he made it weird. I've I've goaded and, you, and now we're here. Uh, the, the, the interesting part about this for me is um, I'm not sure. Is this is this a talk? Is it? A, it's not a keynote, is it? It's a, it's a discussion. A I think it's more it's of a, a discussion. It's more of a more of a discussion. Oh, it's a dis well. We see we do that anyway. So I mean, why not? Why not hop on the bandwagon for this one? What a, what a laugh! And the best part about this is he has to do all the work, all the comments, <laughs> all the live streaming, etc. For me, this is a normal podcast, which means I have to normally look at Dan's allegedly normal head. But apart from that, it's all it's just another morning of paradise here. I mean, I say paradise, but. It's probably about the same temperature as it is in the Arctic Circle right now. Yes. Thanks, Boston. Appreciate it. <laughs> well, that, um, that's where the um, that's where the conference would normally be. Normally, uh, every year, it's in the north of Norway, uh, near near the Arctic Circle. So, um, but now it's online. That's metal. I I, I love it. Even yeah. <sighs> It's it's so I mean what but there's no US equivalent because it gets to the top and it just stops and then it's bloody snow Mexico what's it called um, Canada it's just Canada after that so you can't go up and up and up and up Norway just goes man just goes up to until the top. it until yeah I mean at the top there's like three shrubs a polar bear and probably a buried time capsule for when everything melts and we all burn well um, awesome we we are I here love stuff like that. Are we are uh, yes, uh, we are here, and we're going to be talking about um, the transparent uh, evaluation of scientific work. Um, Good Lord, man! Yeah, I thought this would be a um, a fitting topic for for what we're um, for for the conference because this is sort of the, the sort of thing that is typically discussed at the conference. But I guess we should probably define what we're talking about um, when it comes to to, to this idea of. Uh, of the the transparent value evaluation of work and the main thing we're going to be talking about is this idea of we know that uh, transparency is becoming a big thing in science for how you actually do your methods the transparency mm. with data which is which is a, which is a whole discussion when it comes to the transparency of data but one thing which isn't spoken about much is the transparency of peer review which is really interesting because peer review is is a central plank of what we do when it comes to the evaluation of our work. Yet peer review almost always happens behind closed doors. You have the editor, you have the peer reviewers, and you have the authors who see the comments. Yet um, when we actually see a paper that's published online or wherever, wherever you read it, we don't see what happened behind closed doors. And the vast majority, I know there are a few journals like the BMC family, for instance, that actually do um, publish their peer review reports, but we have no idea how these papers were actually evaluated, and that's what we're going to be talking about for for, for this episode. Your your general thoughts about this, James? Well, my general thoughts are the way you introduced it is is very unfair to people who've been talking about peer review for years. I, I, um, I, I know it's definitely not a um 
uh, a new console. I mean, maybe, 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 maybe it doesn't. Maybe it doesn't have the same cachet as open everything else. But the there's oh, it's there's a paper from ninety nine is the earliest one I can remember by De Corsay, which is a big discussion on open peer review. Um, well, look, there's a series of there's a series of competing concerns, and there is an enormous social drag factor behind talking about peer review as an open process. And it's the fact that when you open it up and you remove the anonymity, it has problems for a variety of people. And when given the option to be open, um, when we talk, we talk about signed review or mandatory open review or the Frontiers version of like open review if you live through the process and fill out all the stupid little boxes, a lot of people don't want that because they think it interferes with their ability to be honest and they feel like it, it opens them so they open themselves up to criticism. And hang on, before you jump in, you horrible wombat, <laughs> The, there is a, a perception I've talked about many times on this podcast and also muttering to myself walking down the street and some such. There is a tremendous academic fear of appearing to be a target in any given context. Now, there's a, a similar fear behind open data and open methods. I've obviously asked for a lot of that. If anyone's even vaguely familiar with my work, I, I'm usually the person who's at the, the pointy end of asking you for your data set because I want to hit you with a big stick for doing something terrible. Um, and a lot of people, it's very obvious over time that a lot of people don't want to have an open conversation about what they've done because they're afraid of making a mistake. Is that the scientific ethos? No, but it is the ethos of science done professionally. Now, the difference between that and peer review itself is pretty obvious, and it's the fact that peer review you will often find yourself in a situation where someone in their mid-20s is writing to someone in their mid-50s saying, your paper is a garbage fire and it screams at me and I hate it and you shouldn't have written it down in the first place. You will never, you will never unthread that particular needle socially you will never find people in especially especially with resources the way they are maybe not in the norways but maybe even in the norways a bit right you still pre you're still pre-permanent you're still not particularly confident a lot of the time or sometimes in the case of young scientists wildly overconfident which is always good fun um you're never going to unthread the social needle of it's really difficult out an ass kicking or even just to of impertinent questions if you have a massive difference in the immediate social power and professional standing of two participants in a process and that's why even even when you're allowed to open it yourself that's why there's a, 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 a central plank across this bridge that's never going to go away now while i'm making a complete fool of myself here one 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 additional thing um that is just the social aspect of it. There are plenty of other things as well. Uh, there's an incident a few years ago. I'll give you one example and then you can disagree with me. There's an incident a few years ago where me and a friend of mine, who I won't name for legal reasons, both reviewed for a journal and he suddenly got it into his head that all peer reviews should be free. And he talked to the journal and they went, no, you're not allowed to give them away. And he goes, well, I wrote it. So I'm doing it. And they were really upset. They were really upset. He wrote it. To, actually, actually, it wasn't negative peer review. It was really normal. You know, like this is, oh, consider this extra analysis. Add this. I don't like the margins. Uh, consider choosing comic sans. There's shit like that. And he gave away mine as well. Now, I thought this was hilarious, but the journal went, you you could you you wrote it and then you showed people you monster so it's not just the social factor there's obviously like there's institutional drag factors as well and i presume we're going to get into those because you're nodding a lot you look like a dashboard dog 
I, I agree. And look, uh, a few people have raised, or we, we have this uh, issue raised that there's an important distinction between signed peer review and um, peer review where you simply share it, but you don't necessarily sign your name. Um, that, that was uh, brought up in the chat by an overly honest editor. We love you, overly honest editor. You should follow overly You are honest. overly honest, and that occasionally is grating, but in general, yeah. Uh, follow overly honest editor on, on Twitter. Um, and uh, so that's an important distinction to make. And then we, had a, we got a comment from uh, John Smith that uh, eLife is notorious for its open peer review, but it is an online-only journal. What assurances do we have that it will not one day go under and delete all the open peer reviews, papers, data, etc. cetera. Uh, I think that's a, that's a really good... <laughs> that's a freaking hilarious comment coming from someone with the most anodyne name in the whole world. <laughs> well, <laughs> Jeffrey, real person. Thanks, John Smith. Hey, if ma- that ma- is, in fact, a real name. What assurances do we have? We have we have no assurances of that, apart from the fact that eLife was set up uh, in the first instance on a very strong ethos of getting away from many of the centrally controlled uh, aspects, I suppose, of the really big fancy life science journals. Um, that it was it was set up to be online only, open access, open review, et cetera, et cetera. It's part of their identity. Um, you mean, you've got to go and check their bylaws and shit if you want to know like whether or not they can. Um, but in the meantime, those things are probably the same as any other academic object. They're semi-permanently to permanently attached as digital objects to space that's always going to be there. Like of course, um, it's, it's, I don't think they'll change their mind about it because it's it's part of it's part of who they consider themselves to be. It's part of why they got started in the first place. You know, it's um. I mean, it's most most of these journals have built this into the cost that they if they if all of a sudden they run out of money, they have thirty years, forty years where they can actually store the paper, uh, store the papers and the data. I don't know the exact details of their life, mm. um, but I'm assuming that this would be written into the bylaws of the journal, that there is actually a, a permanency plan for, for what they do. Um, of course, there's a... Yeah, probably. A, yeah, I mean, there are situations... Adi- additional, additional, if, we talk, if you're talking about like persistent digital storage like that, reviews are much, much, much smaller than everything else. Text because in, in general, it's just text. We've had a comment from... In general, it's just, it's just Unicode. It's, just, it's not, it's not a, if it's a neuroimaging data set, that's probably bigger than all the reviews that were written everywhere this year, like in one hit. We've got a, a comment from um, Emma Gainley, who's, uh, who's coming in from Scotland, that uh, most journals have archives set up with things like clocks, controlled lots of copies that keep stuff safe. Um, so it's essentially an archive. Um, for for this uh, for this potential issue, um, and that yeah, I, that that's uh, thanks for thanks for bringing it up. Um, that we do, yeah, most journals actually ha- have these backups there. And I'm assuming, like you said, because these things are text files and they're very small, these peer review reports can be kept. Now, I think one thing that's interesting, our most recent guest, Kaylin O'Connor, that we had on the, on the podcast, you can check it out, uh, episode 120, brought up, um, was discussing this idea of how uh, scientific fields um, change their their practices especially when some of their practices uh, are incorrect and uh, in, in this particular case she said it was actually quite interesting because a lot of these discussions were happening um, online and journalists were investigating it um, people could actually look back and see how these things evolve over time which is very interesting especially if you're looking in the philosophy of science or you're working in the history of science so i think it's quite mm. interesting with the concept of having open and transparent peer reviews is that in the future we can actually go back and see how peer review actually happened because right now we have no idea this stuff is not does not tend to be written down um so this is a very interesting aspect when we're actually looking at how science is done we can actually see how science is done and how this is uh, how this is changing over time uh, i had a discussion about this literally last night okay. looking at a truly gruesome paper that is, of course, on the plague, like everything else now is on the plague. You know, you study toenail fungus. It's the effect of sitting at home for six months on the toenail fungus and the plague, et cetera, et cetera. But this was on uh, school reopening. Um, and the paper itself, once you actually dig into it, is quite dreadful. Um, it is It is poor. It's methodologically poor. To the extent where the first thing that you want to know, the first question that you have is, who reviewed this? 
What 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 was not 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 just sort of like let's point at them and laugh, which is good for twenty seconds, but then you get to the real question, which is, what issues did they raise? What were the issues raised around? What kind of the dis- what kind of the discussion happens? Because you can see that if you had access to an archive of this, as a meta scientific object of study, a big bag of previously closed reviews for a kind of a NLP analysis or something similar would be the single best resource I can think of to be able to legitimately study what the hell is going on when academic publishing occasionally goes off the rails. Honest, straight, I would, I would take a sabbatical from my job and learn what NLP is <laughs> rather than just working with people who tell me how it works to be able to study something like that. Because you you see it from the inside. You see curiosities all the time that then are disappeared. You, you get funny reviews yourself. You see things that other reviewers say. You disagree with other reviewers completely. Or you see things at the other end of the spectrum that people who are way more diligent than me. I've, I, I watched, I've watched this happen close up. My paper go through four rounds of revision with someone else who, who were like every single thing in the paper and they fixed everything. And it was 4,000 times better when they were actually done with it. It was like, you should just be a co-author at this point, for fuck's sake. <laughs> you've, you've, everything you've written down is longer, <laughs> longer than the paper. All of those contributions, yeah, as, as, a, a, as, as contributors to a culture of transparency, good theoretically but to be able to look through them like the fly on the wall aspect as an object of study it kills me that that information exists and that there's probably no reasonable facility to ever pry it out of most journals it's probably not a thing or if you did they'd want to anonymize it to a degree past which it was impossible to to draw anything useful from it because you know, privacy that's a that's an interesting point because a lot of the times around these discussions we think about that it's the authors that don't want this to happen it's the peer reviewers that don't want this to happen but not many people discuss whether the journals are the ones that don't want this to happen it's great that there are some journals who are doing this um a lot of journals are piloting this this very idea of sharing it um but um some papers i mean every week there's a paper that gets a lot of heat for some reason or another um, typically, mm. it's, typically it's a COVID paper. Other times it's not. And well, it the, is right now, yeah. This, there's one happening right now. And typically the first question people ask on Twitter is, who reviewed this? And with some papers and with some journals, we can actually see who did that. Um, but for others, we, we can't. So one of the things I think... No, where, 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 is, it, where is it possible? Um, abbreviated list. Obviously, someone already said eLife. Good one. Yep. Um, I think BMJ have some openness BM- bmc uh, is generally P- openly by default the bmc family of uh, right. at least in the biomedical um, field we're P- showing our biases P-J- here pj does um every review i've written for pj is like oh, this is going on the historical record i'm gonna have to be a, i'm gonna have to be a very sensible man today how, um, how much do you change there are some others how much do you change how you actually do it for those journals when you know your name is going to be there what what changes in your reviews only the degree to which it's made accessible for someone else reading it. I will spend more time writing it as a document because if I know someone who doesn't have the context is coming in from the outside, I will spend a little bit more time turning stuff into sentences. Because look, someone's just written five and a half thousand words on specific topic A. I don't need to start with topic A is an exploration of theory B. It's it's totally redundant. But if it's an object that other people are going to read, tiny little bit more time. Give it a little bit of context, turn it into a document that's actually legible rather than just the usual staccato shotgun of what I hope are good points within a context where someone will understand that immediately. It has a different purpose. But doing that would add so much value for people who are reading it. Um, and it doesn't take that much extra time. Few, um, few, few minutes. Few minutes. Few yeah. Minutes. So that that's yep. um yeah. 
we got a good question in the chat. Um, this idea of who is a peer, is it someone from the same field or is, isn't it important to have a review from non-peers to have diversity in the process? This is a really good point. I, I think the ideal oh, paper... Oh, the, the, I, I, we could do whoever you are, anonymous weirdo, we could do a whole episode on... Because that crosses over into the issue of expertise versus non-expertise, but it also crosses over into the issue of kind of scientific monoculture versus exposure to everything else. And there's obviously, well, everything else, it's a scientific field that's not within the monoculture. So the polyculture, oh, that's a that's a $10 Poly. word for this <laughs> early in the morning. Um, there, obviously, there's areas where we continually say add add someone who's not directly from this field, but it's always a statistician for obvious reasons, you know? It's like, well, this paper is on emotion. Um, no one ever goes, well, we should definitely add uh, an anthropologist or we should definitely add a plant biologist, but everyone will always support, we should always add a statistician. Um, obviously, there's areas where that is really appropriate especially when especially when things cross over um a couple of years ago because i we were we were beaten up at the time on some really terrible and racist research um and there was a little bit of pieces of it that were kind of psychodynamic theory and i remember reading it reading it at the time not well but you know you had a go um thinking how does this literature tradition persist while modern psychology exists it's interesting it seems like there's no crossover whatsoever why is there and then you you look it up and then you realize that there's still actually quite especially in french for some reason i think it has to do with the sort of the french historical embrace of kind of psychodynamic ideas it's very obviously a protected monoculture. So whoever you are, anonymous weirdo, um, a very interesting point is there's a lot of fields I think that deliberately don't want that. Why? Because every time they go, it's, why? Because they have a an intellectual object, an intellectual field that they're all collectively committed to. And every time they go outside of that, they receive criticism from people who study the rest of the world <laughs> or the same ideas from the, a much broader perspective where it's far more legitimate to have a, a broader opinion. So the two things that immediately come to mind, are, as I said, the sort of the, the, the remnants of like the last few leather patches wearing lunatics in a library somewhere um, who are still talking about whether or not Sigmund Freud combed his hair. Um, and people who are the, the hard, hardcore Chomsky crazy people, um, as if language hasn't moved on in the last 50 years. I don't think either of feels, feels like that. They've, they're, this is like those Mott and Bailey castle thing. And, you know, they're, they're, they're up the hill behind the enormous oak planks trying to avoid the march of modernity. So, you know, there's people who don't want that. Um, it's also, look, this is the, the other thing I'd say is ask an editor. Because damn, That's I mean, it's listening. hard. It's it's hard enough getting people. I've heard so much, especially over the last year or so. The plague has definitely not made this easier. It is hard to get people to agree to do this sometimes, especially when you have people like me out there demanding money for it because it's not my job anymore. <laughs> I never thought I I. I'm, Side, side point on the 450 move, but honestly, look, it's something that was originally supposed to amuse me personally. Can you give, like, give the, a quick overview of what this is? I'm not, I'm not an academic anymore. You're asking me to review things. You're giving me a week to do it. Um, I got a request for this uh, a, a while ago, months back now. I got a request from a journal and my brain switched over into business mode immediately because I had a request, like it was a kind of a side job or a consulting gig. And the first thing I thought was, oh, I should write up a contract and send it to these people because they want me to do work. I probably got the time. Okay, fair enough. I go, wait a minute, this is peer reviews. Uh, we don't pay money for that. And I realized that I had two brains at that point, the academic version who did this shit for free uh, and the person who works for a living. 
and it's not part of my service anymore. And it's not a part, of, a part of a lot of other people's service anymore. There's not some big tenure file for most most people who've got staff jobs, graduate students, um, adjunct faculty, most most junior people in most situations. There's not some big service file where you 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 you, you you you're doing it only because it's it's out of goodwill and social expectation. And then you realize a lot of people who are building that service file to prove that they're good to the community don't do it. We've heard that a few times. That's one of the yeah, we talk about a nasty toxic attitude. Basically, there's no delta for me in doing peer review. Uh, I can spend all my time raising money and doing other stuff. I'm not interested really in what other people are doing. I've got my own shit to be getting on with. I'll do that. No one's who heard that a couple of times. That's I remember that sticking in your head the first time we realized that that was a real attitude mm-hmm. that some senior researchers had. I remember you you furrowed your little brow. What's a, what's a furrow? Oh, you were you were my you were my cranky little fella that day, weren't you? <laughs> you got all worked up. I did. Veins popping out. Look, a, a very interesting <laughs> a very interesting comment um, for a different perspective for diversity in peer review. Some journals include patients or user representatives for if, if they're talking about a particular topic. And I think that's very interesting. Uh, I know there's one journal within autism in which you work closely together with autistic individuals for actually putting together a plain language summary. There's, there's an abstract for, for, for autistic individuals and their families. That's really cool. And I, I really like that. And I wish more journals actually did that, especially ones okay. that are focusing on a specific thing. In that there's, there are fields where, the people who are being studied, studied, and the community around them, and the research that goes on with them have a much more symbiotic relationship than they do elsewhere. So autism, obviously, uh, chronic fatigue, uh, certain rare diseases, uh, there, there is a crossover. Uh, sometimes the crossover goes as far as uh, multiple studies for the same person over time. Uh, the parents or people in community groups know the researchers. They have a, a kind of a, 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 a frequent cross communication. You, you you can pilot stuff from time to time with someone or some family that you know who is affected by whatever it is you're talking about. Um, so in a context where you actually get people participating directly in the research, sometimes raising money for the research to be done through either personal or nonprofit means. The idea that the people are involved in the communication of that research is obviously necessary. I wouldn't even say it's good. I'd say it's necessary at totally that agree. point yeah. because the people who are involved um, – the people who are involved go broader than the research community. Like the, the parents, I guess it's going to be some Lorenzo's oil shit. The parents of the sick child or the sick individual or the lady with the sick grandmother are actually going to read the research. So it is strongly inherent on you to get not only the right perspective of someone who understands it, but the more general community perspective of people. This, this, this happens. I mean, uh, Facebook gets a lot of stick. The vast majority of it's deserved. But <laughs> the there are plenty of things in it that are organized around specific conditions like this. Um, there, there's actually the, the interesting version of this right now is people who have this like the long COVID thing, mm. right? Who suffering from it's 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 on ongoing uh, issues with energy, uh, on, ongoing issues with respiration, and then some other complications like uh, neurological symptoms, pericarditis, stuff like that. Um, people got to organize and talk about it in the same place. Those communities of people are real, and they share your research. And they read it, and they try to understand it. So that is now part of your professional community. And if you're not going to attempt to explain it to them, then you know, you're leaving it open to interpretation. Yeah. So you know, it's it makes it makes perfect sense. Um, I mean, if you think of like, <laughs> there's a degree to which is obviously that can't happen. Uh, I like good luck explaining your laboratory biology to the mice that you just did the study on. 
Um, I don't squeak that good. So I, I, I don't, I don't know how that's possible. Um. <laughs> we, we've got a, a great. We, we... Ah, sorry, sorry. I just, I really, I really take it with that idea. Yeah, finish um, I, I don't, I don't have any direct experience. I mean, I was in uh, autism research for a while, um, but I never encountered that, and it would have been really interesting, especially from the perspective because there's another thing that's coming out here. We study. Uh, biosignals that are collected from people with autism. How they would explain something coming out as a kind of a lived experience as something where it's really hard to understand the headspace. I would have loved that. I would have loved to have had someone who was on the autistic spectrum explain research back to me. Because yeah. I spent an awfully long time. Look, I, I bought a book that was like living with autism something something. It's here somewhere. Because I did not understand what it was like. And I was never going to really fully understand it. But it helped to it helped to try. And I mean, there's only so much resources out there. So we should actually be spending the money on things that uh, user, users and their, their families actually want. It's amazing. Um, uh, I'm not sure how the things are in states, but uh, a, lot of, a lot of the grants that we Bad. do... Bad. Well, no, when it comes to, like, we have to say, here are our two user representatives. They were consulted for this grant application and we've actually tailored our grant application based on feedback to what users actually want. Because you, you might go, oh, yes, you know, we're looking for, we're looking for treatments to, to, to fix this, this. And they're like, we just want to, like, parents are going, we just want to help our kids sleep a little bit better. What can, can you help me there? And we, a lot of people t tend to ignore um, what, the, what the users and their families uh, actually want. So th this is, uh, this is a, a really good point. Now, we've been speaking about getting um, uh, the transparency and peer review and we've had a great point brought up in how whether we can integrate um, artificial intelligence in peer review in the process. Uh, for instance, uh, image manipulation. Uh, this, is, uh, <laughs> this, is, this is interesting. Um, and a lot of people quite often are speaking with Elizabeth Dick, um, who, is, uh, who is famous, and we've had her on the show a number of episodes ago, for actually spotting these things. This is really hard, and it's a very difficult problem to... I mean, some, with, in some regards, you can catch some things with some sort of um, uh, with, with software, but a lot of the time you actually need, need this expertise. So it hasn't been done before. But I think there is a space for actually bringing in AI as, as, the, as the fourth reviewer. We can actually improve the peer review process um, I mean, we already, we already have this in terms of plagiarism detection. It doesn't work all the time. But typically what it does is it goes, hey, we've detected there is a chance of this thing. And then a human will go and see this. Oh, yeah, it's just the methods. That's fine. Or I go, oh, no, this was completely lifted. So having this AI assistance, I reckon, can, um, can really help with actually um, improving improving peer review. So we've had a few comments on... Okay, it's so so hard. If, Sorry, I know everyone who's listening to this is used to hard topics and hard projects and multiple years worth of work. Doing a fully automated assessment of something that's as heterogeneous as research, it's really hard. Yeah? If you split it down, look, we, could, we couldn't get Grim working just to extract tables. You know, the one thing that would actually make this more possible is papers having a machine-readable structure in the first place. Mm. We don't even do that. We haven't. That would be the first thing that you would do on the, the groundwork rather than trying to get something to suck everything out beautifully because it wrecks tables, it wrecks statistics, it wrecks images versus text, it the, or everything that goes into the typesetting is all a huge pain in the hole when it comes to actually being able to feed the machine to begin with. Um, and I don't want to get started off down the AI is difficult and most people who say they are doing AI are lying to you path, but... Believe me, there's fewer there's fewer experts than you think. What's possible is amazing, but it's a it's it's a little bit like rocket packs to me. You know? They were always five years. They've been five years in the future for, for 30 years. Um I would I would love it because the best thing that you can do is it's scary as if the first thing we're going to do is build a entirely like a machine only assessment vehicle and then just let it out into the world to ruin everything. 
the best thing that you can do for something like that, the first thing that we're going to do, if anything like that, for image manipulation, for any kind of problems with the text, for making an assessment of trustworthiness, which is a project that's been proposed that I'm actually a participant on, whether or not it gets funded is a different idea. Um, all of this is, all of this is possible. Um, it's just, I mean, people think it's hard, but it's harder than that. That's that's the quick version. Um, but the, the first thing we're going to do is use it to triage human decisions. Yep. That's the first thing that's going to happen. Yep. So people who are afraid of the rise of the robots, it's just going to be another tool. It's it's going to it's going to present you something that gives you uh, a piece of information you can act on, rather than going and acting itself. We so I have I have no fears in that regard. We've had a great uh, point raised by... Um, what what some... happened to questions at the end? You're doing questions the whole way through. Whole, whole and now way through. This, whole way now through, mate. this Mad Lib style see, thing. See to the pants here on I can't see any of this. And all of a sudden, you're having the ideas of the some intellectual total of the entire conference. And you're going, well, here's something you've never heard before. We had a plan for this, you dick. <laughs> this, this, this was the plan. This was the plan. Oh, this was the plan the whole this, time. This you was all... Neglected to tell me. This was Thank always the plan. Thank you so much, Norway. I appreciate your attention <laughs> to detail. No, actually, the questions are good. I just resent your face. Now, we... ask it. <laughs> We uh, had this question, um, which we're, we're going to get to anyway, but it's this idea that um, one of the main criticisms about, okay, this is all fine if you're going to have if you're going to have transparent peer review, this is all good, but what about the 90% of papers which are rejected, firstly, either on the, on the editor's desk or rejected after peer review? Uh, what is, how, there are some journals, um, mm. uh, M- MetaSci, for instance, MetaPsychology does this, who actually do, publish the reviews of rejected papers um mm. but this is this is a difficult issue um mm. and some people have argued and those that that person being nick brown is that is it even valuable to do this if we're not going to be publishing the negative peer reviews um really really hard question with a lot of stuff melted into it Really difficult question. Everyone's familiar with journal shopping. Um, this happened to us recently, not 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 for want of trying or in any cynical perspective, Dan. We were co-authors on a very, very large mega analysis of some neuroimaging data. Really huge paper, uh, very well facilitated by Julian Koenig, the hardest working man in science. Um <laughs> That's not an exaggeration. He appears to be. Um, so this is th- uh, basically, a, a, without g- getting into the weeds, an enormous amount of neuroimaging data was not aggregated as a meta-analysis. We got, I shouldn't say we, I only helped write the damn thing. Uh, he got the numbers, the actual data sets from all of the different papers. 20 labs. And yeah. Um, which and when it was uh, it was far more than uh, twenty data sets though because many of them had multiples, um, and they were all reanalyzed with the same method from scratch. It all there was a commonality in the method. So, I mean, without getting into the results, uh, it was an enormous project with uh, somewhere between seventy and eighty authors. I can't even remember. Yeah, I barely about recognized about half of the obviously. Yeah, so we sent it somewhere fancy, and they went, I have no idea what any of this is, piss off. Um, and then we sent <laughs> it somewhere much. else fancy, and they went, um, not sure what we're looking at here. And then we sent it to PsychoPhys, a specialty journal that looks at the, cor- the correlative activity between psychological and physiological stuff, who immediately went, Oh God, you've done well here. Um, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Let's have a conversation about this. So those were, those were desk rejections. They weren't getting reviewed. The journals just went, this isn't within our purview. So I was thinking now, it's like the, the, the chain that's connected together. You're basically saying, what's the bad smell effect of the paper? What follows it from site to site to site to site? If it gets reviewed somewhere and rejected and then it goes somewhere else. Should its rejection follow along with it? Now, there there are some complications here. 
And one of them is the fact that I, I think there's a reasonably strong psychological effect of, say, a paper that was rejected out of hand by someone who was difficult, arrogant, didn't get it, came from a different intellectual tradition and was just being a big parochial dick, right? And that follows it along to the next journal and then someone else sees it. I've seen things like that happen in review internally within the same journal. Um, I had a paper rejected once and I wrote to the editor and went, why are you rejecting this? Like after the review, I can address all of this stuff. And also this person appears to be about 80 years old and really personally unpleasant. And the editor went, ah, oh, well, I can't say anything back to them because they're old and important. And I went, oh, well, you're quizzling. Fine. I will take my bat and ball and go home. But I thought, afterwards what would happen if that review which was all stuff that was primarily addressable followed it to the next journal if you wanted that piece of information to be useful to change the actions of the second set of reviewers the easiest way that you could make that work in your favor is by making a series of changes on the basis of the review so, you know, this is the first version. This is the, uh, this is the response to that first version. This is your second version in a different outlet. But now someone's got to go and cross-correlate all this information. Now this long, complicated document has got like long, complicated changes. So for the second journal, it's like you're hopping into the review midstream. You've got a lot more to read. You've got a lot more to understand. Um, it actually makes the job of giving that full intellectual consideration in a lot of contexts, much harder. Have you ever been parachuted into a review as reviewer three or four when yeah. it's on its second revision? It is super hard. And is. There's, there's a, there is a paperback's worth of shit to understand sometimes. I have been in that situation and just written at the top, I'm not reading any of the other stuff because frankly, I mean, there's only so much time in the day, cats. This is, this is like a 6,000 word paper. And then there appears to be another 6,000 words of like, this is like Mills and Boone level now. You know, you can put a paperback novel on this and sell it as the world's worst erotic fiction. It's that long. You know, it's halfway to being a master's thesis. Um, and all of it has interrelated parts. There's a point, there's a point past which people won't use that information. There's a point past which people who are in a hurry, who don't have a lot of time, who don't have a lot of resources, who don't have a lot of money, are going to skip over the, oh, let's be incredibly scrupulous part. People aren't incredibly scrupulous to begin with. Good reviews often are the worst. This paper are really good or a done good job. Congrats. Doesn't you help. You don't learn a thing. No. 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 So if you, this is this, this, this whole idea of, well, if you give everyone full transparency, I think honestly, anything like that will be a, a lot like uh, open data where basically a lot of it goes up in public and no one ever reads it. You can read it if you need to, but it's not going to be engaged with. That's the, now, the problem with this is this is within the process of engagement, right? It's in the process of evaluation. It's not after the fact. It's not some kind of insurance policy that nothing truly ridiculous happened. So, I mean, Nick is well known. Nick Brown, Mr. Brown, who became Dr. Brown. God, I love saying it like that. Um, he uh, is well known for being cynical about whether or not the human factors of something will get in the way of the thing and, and, and scientific ideas. It is wildly impractical a lot of the time. Um, and that perspective I share on something like this. I think there's a point past which you can include information where it's not practical to expect people to use it. Wow, that was a really long discussion. I hope I actually answered a question in there somewhere. <laughs> I, think, I think you did. Okay, so let's... <laughs> You just can't remember what it was. Let, let's say. Go let, on, you talk. Go on, you talk. Let, let's say we're able to overnight, we're able to change things, and we're, we're able to get past all the impediments that we have for for making peer review transparent. Um, mm. I think there, I think there is a sticking point. Um, I am all for transparent peer review, but I don't think people should be forced to reveal their identities. Um, 
However, if you're tenured, then, then you should be doing this thing. I, I don't see any reason why you shouldn't if you have uh, a permanent position. Um, but let, let's say we're able to do this where as of tomorrow, um, every single author or every single peer review report um, was made public and um, mm. ten, tenured folks had the names there and non-tenured folks had the decision there. Uh, a year later, how would this change science? What do you think would happen for the scientific enterprise if we're able to go, if, if peer review all of a sudden was to be out there and public? I don't know. I, I would. I have... don't. I don't. I don't. I don't know. Um, I think it would actually cross over a lot with how mass accessible the information was. Like, do you have to log in? Or if I have to log into Scholar One to read someone else's goddamn peer review remarks, I, I, I think. I think the one big thing that would happen. Well, it's a really broad question. I think the one big thing that would happen was when it came to really obvious oversights um, or really terrible papers that somehow made it through the kind of publication screen or similar. The reviews for those would be heavily scrutinized and people would immediately go straight to, you know, if my job was still tooling around the academic literature looking for things to shake a stick at, um, it might make my job a hell of a lot easier. Um, I often wonder sometimes the, the, the meta scientific possibilities are great because I mean, just, just on a casual level, if you see a foolish decision in a paper, I wonder sometimes I've wondered for a very long time, is this what you planned or did someone make you do this in order to get it published? I would really love to know the answer to that question sometimes. I think there would be a, I think we wouldn't get much past an amorphous appreciation of just how truly bad peer review can be sometimes. What? No, I agree. What? Oh, you agree, Captain yeah. Snickers. I'm, sni okay. I'm snickering oh. in agreement. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's a snicker of agreement. All right. Hey, have we gone formally to full Q&A now? Yeah, I mean, pe pe people, are, people are answering questions. So if you do if you do want to get your stuff in, um, maybe we can do some quick fire responses with your questions. Apologies if I've missed your question before. There's quite a few coming through in the stream. Um, but if you do if you do have one, then, 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 then go for it there. Um, got some good uh, some good comments here that um, we shouldn't be paying uh, AI for peer review, or letting it peer, letting AI do peer review. We should be paying humans the four hundred and fifty, um, which is in reference to James's four hundred and fifty movement. And now we have the third Hertzy who has come in, come to join the show. Um, hey buddy, hey buddy, <laughs> he's, he was a bit sick the last couple of days, so he's, he's feeling a bit sorry for himself. My little pal here. I, I hey. on that idea of how. <laughs> Or how things would actually change with peer review. I, I would have the feeling that um, I do like the one thing I do like about the the frontiers. The front, a lot of people have a lot of things to say about frontiers, but two things are good. The, it's a it's a very checkered organization, Dan. Yeah. Um, people people lean into both sides of the it is good, it is bad, too hard often, in my opinion. But go on. The review process, how it works, is very good. We're heavy, we have back and forth feedback um, between authors and peer reviewers. Um, secondly, um, they were the publisher to popularize this idea of actually putting a name to the review. Um, however, what's interesting here is that um, typically a paper will have two or three reviewers um, and they don't say, they don't actually post the peer review reports, um, or at least they haven't done that uh, when, when I was regularly working with them. But you have the names there. So you have three names who, of the people that actually reviewed that. Um, and I always wondered how much would that actually improve the quality of peer review? Because you know, when this paper gets published, or if this paper gets published, mm. um, my name is going to get attached to that. And that when that question on Twitter comes, who reviewed this paper? You can actually go, if it's a Frontiers paper. Hey, yeah, yeah. You, 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 can, you can point out names and you can see exactly who did this. So, um, and it, this, this sort of speaks to a point that's been brought up in the chat about the backfire on early career researchers with this idea of, of peer review. Um, look, I, I don't think there's any justifiable way that we can actually force early career researchers to put their names on reviews because there can be repercussions for careers. And then a lot of people have asked, oh, have said, oh, you know, I haven't actually heard that many stories of repercussions. Yeah, but that's because the people who have, who have had repercussions are already vulnerable. So they're not going to be telling stories of their repercussions either. These things... Or, or it's not something that, like, Dan, if I'm a, if I'm a senior researcher and a real bastard... 
Um, and I'm trying to like, I'm gatekeeping someone out of my journal um, or I've written a cranky note to their boss or they've applied to work within my lab and I've immediately thrown away the application, even though they're the most qualified. I'm not going to write a Facebook story about that. You know, I'm not going to write like shitty a, things a, a I fleet? did this week, a blog. There are things that there are the things that you won't find out. And we do know, of course, that there are mean, evil, difficult, weird people in academia. I mean, you, you see that spill out into the legal system and other avenues. You think you think that wouldn't? Yeah, people are trying to take every advantage that they've got. Because the other thing is, is that um, people who are like that venal are uh, like they can they can they can come for you if they want to make your life difficult. Or you might just end up in a situation where like even you uh, you've got a, a a field with a small uh, a small community of people, and there's one editor who is unpleasant and basically says oh I'll remember you you'll never publish anything in my journal ever again full stop end of story and i could roll that out to your whole research group if you if they, if they wanted i've seen people like hang their hat on some astonishing pettiness they just don't like people because they don't like people uh and then they have a decision making power a lot of the time especially in editorial which is essentially unchecked you reject something out of hand no one's ever going to find out unless they complain and then, of no... course, it's and then it is you're defending a subjective decision. There's no this, you know, you the, the best paper with the biggest sample, it goes to an editor who doesn't like you and they reject it. You could tell the world, and the editor will say, Well, we're trying to focus more on the like the little guy here, it's not the focus of the journal. There's yeah. a fucking thousand ways out of that. This, this is, I mean, for a job that occasionally is difficult. It's difficult to enroll people to, to be an actual editor. They do have, in many respects, unchecked power. Especially and in the a smaller sm fields. Yeah, and exactly, especially in a smaller field where you, it would be inappropriate or weird to send something to a, like a bulk journal because um, they're just going to get the same reviewers in the same community, you know? They just look at all the stuff you cite and go, oh, some of these people will do. Oh, oh you all made up your mind. You hate him. Oh, okay, never mind. We got any more questions? Let's hurt someone's feelings. <laughs> I've got a this comment. Is, uh, someone asked Dan a personal <laughs> question. We got we got, we got a comment um, that uh, James, that your dimples are adorable. There we go. Yes, they are. Yes, they always have been. They've been adorable from when I was very very small. And as my head got bigger, as I aged, the dimples actually have gotten like huge. So now I look like this weirdly overscaled Dickensian orphan that's trying to be winsome. Um, yeah, thank you for recognizing the fact that I am in fact adorable. <laughs> Single best remark so far. There we go. There, there, there's the winner. Um, so a lot, a lot of discussion between between people, which is uh, which is great about double and single blind review. I think when you actually re when when you watch the replay of this um, um of this recording, you can actually see all the kind of stuff. Um, we've got a comment from from uh, um, yes, we answered that on early career researchers and transparency. So yeah. A lot of. Uh, Are you having difficulty multitasking yeah, or something? Yeah, a, a little, a little bit. There's, there's, there's quite a few. Is, I, I think you you you're not really from the kind of Twitch world where you can simultaneously maintain a narrative and then continually be distracted by it by things that are happening. And one of the reasons that I've said everything I've just said is to give you the opportunity to ask a goddamn question properly. <laughs> there is no question. But there is, there's, oh. there's, there's comments, James. I see what you're doing. There are comments. It. This is more a comment than a question. Thank more, you so much, everyone. More we don't have enough of that at conferences, do we? No. Well, well so Maybe we don't have any opinions that are, are, are worth canvassing, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. We, we have to wrap up, James. We, we've come to the end. Oh, I suppose. We're coming to the end of our time slot. If you're, if you, if you're new to the show... Uh, welcome. I'm glad you're able to join us. Um, we've got 120 episodes over uh, over 100. And... This will be 121. This will be 11 squared. Yeah, um, a ton of episodes, um, which which is online. You can go back. A lot of people are going back and do and do the binge, which is very impressive. And usually, we we send them out uh, a mug. Everything hurts mug or a t-shirt or some other some of the other merch that we have. Um, so get yeah. amongst it. Follow follow. Um, if you, if you're liking what you're hearing here, then um, then you can check out the the rest of the episodes but um thanks for watching yeah. uh, enjoy the rest of the munin conference as well um if you're Absolutely. registered yes yes 
And you should to, all you should all definitely do that. Thanks for the organisers for, for for inviting us. I think this is the first time I've ever heard of a conference having a podcast episode or even a discussion as a keynote. So thanks thanks to the organisers. Um, oh, the, we were we were we were a keynote. Look at that keynote. Thank, uh, thanks. Yes. Thanks. Thanks. Do you think this is the Do you think this is the first keynote where one of the speakers has ever said balls? Because <laughs> yeah. I just did. You just did. It's out there. I know. It's just, it's like he, he told me he told me not to be difficult. I'm doing my absolute best. It's okay, it's very can... hard. Things are, <laughs> things are quite stressful in the U.S. right now, and uh, not making fun of Dan's head is something that I have. Uh, you should I, definitely. I can, I can you feel. All, I can feel it there. You should, you should all give him as much money and respect as possible. He is actually a lovely man, and the fact that he puts up with me to do this is a great testament to his staying power and his kind of emotional fidelity. He's exactly the sort of person who you want to retain and promote. He's excellent. There. That's that's there. the nicest thing you've ever you said, said, James. You said yeah, you said I'd never help. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for for joining us for this keynote. Um, um, enjoy the rest of the conference and uh, yeah, we're both on Twitter as well and uh, check out Hertz on uh, on Twitter and all the back episodes. Thanks for listening and uh, hope to see you online or in the world somewhere in the future. See, see you later. Oh, yeah. Rock on, Norway. Wear a mask. <laughs>